All right, let's get, a, let's get this show on the road, shall we, folks, as soon as my screen comes on? All right. Okay. So, this week, a couple things, a couple new things this week, especially when you compare what we happened last week. As you can see, I'm all mic'd up, okay? Um, so, the live streams for this course start today. So please use this as a reference going forward. I'm live streaming all of my classes this semester to YouTube. So if you navigate to my YouTube channel, you will see this very moment being streamed. This is right, exactly. What you see on my screen, let's do it. It'll be like an inception moment where we'll see the stream happening in front of us. So if you're new to this whole live streaming thing, if you just go onto YouTube and do a, a search for my name, Pat Cranley, I should be the first Pat Cranley on the list. There we go. Here's my YouTube channel. And uh, as soon as this, come on in, that's no problem. Uh, as soon as this live stream is done, it's going to pop up. Boom, right here. You can already see that the class that I did yesterday, GCOM 424, has been archived on YouTube. So this is going to be a great reference going forward. So everything that you see and hear me say during class is going to be preserved on YouTube. Shoot, you could even go into my activity stream on my YouTube channel. Let's see. If I get, click this little button and go feed. Yeah, there we go. We're live on the YouTubes right now. Or hopefully we're live on YouTube right now. If it shows up as nothing, I'm going to be very, very disappointed. It's there. Yeah, it, it might not be showing up on my screen, but check it out on yours. Has anyone gotten the stream? I'm looking across the, the sea of computer monitors. I always like to double check from time to time if it's actually streaming something. Yeah, you're getting it. Okay, great. So it is working. Maybe it's just I need to refresh my browser. Yeah, it's working. It's working. This isn't so much a thing. Oh, Safari blocked a pop up. Hey, there I am. Okay, so we're not actually live. There's like a good like 15 second delay as my you know my voice in my picture goes to Mountain View gets crunched in the YouTube servers and is returned to our local machine. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to listen to myself as loud as I can. So just use this as a reference going forward. I find it to be an incredible asset for our classes. So keep that in mind. Okay. And it's a great way to kind of troll all the other classes that I'm teaching. So if you want to audition like my 3D modeling class, just go look at the live stream so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. And if you're sick, okay, you can still come to class. <laughs> ah, now there's no excuse. You, have, there's, you always have, a, have access to the content that's in this class. Yeah. They haven't fixed that computer. Okay. Um, please find a different machine, and I will jump up and down. Looks like there's one next to Dylan in here in the back. Um, and uh, I will jump up and down and, and remind them that they need to fix computer number three. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so to answer Jess's question, no, that doesn't mean you get to stay at home and just watch the classes from home. That's not what this is, okay? These are, I, I kind of think these, these are visual notes. I recognize firsthand that a number of, the, number of the big picture ideas and the concepts are challenging to grasp. So having access uh, to them visually is critical going forward. Um, one thing about the live streams that I always tell my folks on the first time I do it, it's not, you don't have a right to these live streams, okay? Some, if, it, if it's broken one day, it's broken one day, okay? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time troubleshooting the live streams in class because the most important thing is to spend time with you here in person working on our motion graphics study. So if it's broken, it's broken. I'm sorry. Move on, okay? You know, it's, it is what it is. Uh, um, this, I had some, some students get very grumpy with me last semester when it was broken, and I politely reminded them, and it's like, this is not something that, you know, is required for me to do. I'm doing this out of the love and passion of teaching for you guys, okay? So I can do it whenever I want or not do it whenever I want. So please keep that expectation in check. This week, we're going to continue our exploration of motion graphics by talking about text. And text is probably one of the most important elements inside of our kind of toolkit, if you will, of uh, graphic design and motion graphics techniques. Text. So we're going to be spending all of our time talking about creating text and, more importantly, 
animating text inside of motion graphics. If you're coming from other areas inside the graphic design world, text is kind of something that you take for granted. Okay? The, the tools of creating text is super easy, but when you're asked to animate it, it turns into a whole different other, other game. Okay? Let's just really quickly just touch base on what we're going to be building this week. Uh, we're going to focus our efforts around text. We'll come back to this overview section here in a minute. The homework is going to be the road trip assignment coming directly out of our book. I've given you guys a small, small little example of what the expectation for this project is going to be. So this is what you are striving to complete. Very simple. It's going to use a lot of presets and a lot of uh, um, well, fun new things that we'll explore over the next couple hours to yield this result. Okay? Uh, in addition, we're going to get our hands dirty with some text and some preset animations in our lab assignment as you guys are going to be generating an animated business card. And here's a great example of what you potentially could come up with. More on that as we get closer to the lab. OK? Questions? So today's conversation is going to revolve around text. Pretty cool. All right. So let's jump in. Let's do it. Let's hit it. All right. So we're going to start off today by looking at some really great examples of, of text inside of motion graphics. All right, now I hope this shows up and I'll have audio. Text plays an important role inside the larger graphic design industry because it, it allows us to do what? what is, why is text so important? People read. People read. So in every sense, it's the great common denominator. Everyone can read or hopefully everyone can read, okay? So it's our way to directly communicate with our audience. If we design our text strategically and we're very clear with the presentation, it's almost like a direct pathway into our audience's subconscious. It's the most powerful tool that we have in our, uh, at our disposal to communicate with our audience. So it's an important element and we're going to discuss some strategies on how to design text for motion graphics. Now, if you've taken some traditional graphic design classes, perfect, because a lot of the big picture ideas in those courses, like hierarchy, for example, and layout, are really critical, if not the most important elements that we have to consider here in the animation world. We get to put a slightly different spin on it. Why? It always moves, right? Or there's going to be movement involved in it. There's also a duration associated with all the text that we're going to be creating for our animations. I think I mentioned this last week, but I am really kind of jealous of my colleagues in the traditional graphic design department because their, their audiences can spend as much time as they want while looking at those posters and you know, brochures and business cards as they need to. My audiences ha have a defined duration to read that text on screen. So there's some important strategies that we have to employ to ensure their audiences are able to read our text, one of which is you know, kind of the, the condensation of our text down into one or two words. If you're looking at a big poster, you can have the entire thing flooded with text, right? And the audience can spend an hour reading every single word. I can't do that, so I gotta get it down into one, maybe two words. Very simple. We'll come back and talk about those again later, okay? So our text is a little bit different, is a little bit different from the other graphic design industries. However, if we do it correctly, and if we take some of the ideas that we're about to talk uh, about to heart, we can generate some animations that are far more impactful than what we're used to seeing in the traditional graphic design sense. Since our stuff moves, we connect with our audiences on uh, a little bit easier. A whole lot, you know, everything in our world is moving. So when you present them with a static image, is that acts as kind of like a, a little bit of a barrier. But the moment that we get it moving and we start communicating and animating our text in a vernacular of movement that our audience understands, Boom, now it's going to be a little bit easier for our audience to receive the message. Let me show you some really great examples. Text is going to allow us to do a number of things. It's going to communicate directly to our audience. It's going to allow us to speak in a language that they're already familiar with. Well, we can also use it to do some other neat things or not play at all. Let's try it again. There are three brand names on our service stations. Dozens of terms for all we do. 180 addresses for where we work. And 47,000 names for the people who make it happen. But now, there is only one word for the company we've become. Chevron Human Energy. Pretty cool, huh? 
pretty cool. Now let's talk about how the designer of this animation was using text to drive home the message. Now, what did you guys notice about this commercial? What were some of the elements that stood out in your mind? Yeah. Okay, a couple people talk at the same time. Go ahead, shoot, hit me. He ended with two words. Which were those two words? Human energy. Human energy. I like it. Okay. What else? Yeah, absolutely. So if you if we start to break down this commercial, we have a really strong narration, some really strong voiceover, and some really strong motion graphics. Were you guys listening? A little bit. Yeah. For the most part, were you guys listening to what the narration said? Yeah. I find that absolutely fascinating because on a lot of levels, people always say, yeah, I was kind of half listening. What was this about? Three companies coming together. I love it. What else? Meshing and Melden. What else? What else did you get from this commercial? Lots of people working within these companies. What else? I love it. I love it. Now it's also we international, right? International. And uh, for those of you that were kind of half listening, what was the other half of your brain doing? You were reading it, right? You were reading it. It's instinctual. The moment we start place, placing characters on the screen, our audience is going to look and consume those even at a subconscious level. You're going to read it. You, you might not be aware that your brain's actively reading it, but it is, right? It is. It's like when you're driving down the street and, you know, no one's ever going to admit to this, but there are times when you're really not paying attention when you're driving down the street, right? You're fiddling with the radio, oh, pretty bird, you know, heaven forbid you're looking at your phone. You're really not actively participating in the driving experience, yet you are aware the moment the light changes and you step on the brake, right? Your subconscious is always working. You can't turn it off. We are consuming all the visuals even if we're not aware of it. You're reading things even if you're not aware that you're reading things. And this is where the beauty of on-screen text paired with strong narration really comes out, okay? Because you may be listening. You may be an auditory learner. You may be a visual learner. We've appealed to both of those in this animation. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. Very different from the traditional graphic design world where you have to be a visual person to consume that text. I get to appeal on you on three basic levels inside the animation world, which is, or the animated text world, okay? Now, if you design these animations correctly, and if you really spend some time strategically breaking down and understanding what you're trying to say, you can ensure that the on-screen visuals match what the content of your narration is saying. Text is the perfect way to do this. Text is the one common den denominator. It's the, you know, it's, the, it's the highway to your, your audience's subconscious. They're going to read it. Let's take a look at what, what I'm talking about. Let's break it down at the beginning. There are three brand names on our service station. So, three brand names on our service stations. What did they show us? The names of those three brand names. They didn't show us pictures of those three brand names, right? Because that could potentially be miscommunicated. Our audience may get confused as to the differences between all these pictures, right? But when we spell it out, Texaco, Chevron, and I've, I've already forgotten the other one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a, yeah, I'm not much of a, a petroleum export guy, so I really don't have mastery over this industry, but uh, you know, you, you understand it. Dozens of terms for all we do. So what are we going to see here? The, odd, the narrator said dozens of terms for all we do. So what do we see on screen text wise? The dozens of terms for everything that they do, right? They don't have to spell it out. They don't have to say, hey, we do production and exploration and research. You know, just show it to us, right? Your audience is going to pick up on it, even at the subconscious level, right? Now, what's the first thing that you look at on the page here? What? That hydrogen is apparently spelled with a J. Apparently, hydrogen is spelled with a J. I didn't realize that. You know, uh, I, actually, are they all kind of like twittering on? They might be. Oh, see, I see all the, yeah, it's, they're not with a J. See how they're, it's, they're kind of doing this animation where they're going through a whole series of characters. But what's the first word that you read on the, on the, on the screen here? Exploration. Why? It's in the center. It's in the center, right? And it's, bingo, just has it. Those are the two things, okay? Uh, there is areas of contrast immediately surrounding this text element, right? It's right in the center. 
but it's also flanked by some negative space, and our eyes are attracted to areas where there's a big difference, okay? We have positive next to negative, that's where we're going to look, okay? Yes, it is the only static text as well. Absolutely, good, good, uh, good, uh, good find there. Now, let's, uh, let's continue on. A couple other things here. So if we pair what we see on the screen with what we hear, we're almost guaranteeing that our audience is going to understand the overarching message. So what are we su supposed to see here right now? Yeah, the 180 addresses for where they work, okay? So now we're starting to get a much larger picture here. And 47,000 names for the people who make it happen. Apparently, one of the people who make this happen is named Shipping. <laughs> and, and Brazil is also a name that makes this happen. But that's okay. You know, that, that's a detail that only someone like me would really pick up on because, oh, uh, wait. Production, yeah. So the, clearly the motion graphics designer was running out of things to, to incorporate, so he was recycling some. That's okay, because only, only classes like these are we really going to see this, because we get to stop the video and, and kind of pause time. If this was on TV, you wouldn't get that luxury, right? You'd be focusing on the names. You'd be focusing on, uh... What? Brazil shows up twice. Yeah, so they, re they recycle it. Fuel cell research? Come on, that's not a name. For, for repeating the names. They're repeating the names, yeah. So it's just a style. It's a style. Remember, we're trying to go for a feeling and a mood. So don't, don't pick it apart too much. It's still a good commercial, okay? It's still a good commercial. All right. But now, there is only one word for the company we've become. I love it. And I just love that whole animation, right? You know, we go, we go from the macro to the micro. We focus on the details so of the entirety of the, of the commercial through text, and then we take a step back, and now we're seeing it from a much larger perspective. It's beautifully, beautifully done. Okay. All right. A couple other things in here that I want to point out about working with text. And this is just one of a couple examples that we'll see. But let's go back in here a little bit. Let's go to Australia. Has anyone been to Australia? No. Man, is it cool? I've always wanted to go to Australia. It's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. I get the impression just from, from what I see uh, on, on, on television that everything in Australia, Australia will kill you. <laughs> it's, it seems like the world's deadliest everything lives in Australia. Like the world's deadliest bunny rabbit lives in Australia, right? You know, it's, is that just my impression? Okay, just me. All right, anyways. Okay. Dingoes apparently take your baby. What? Also, apparently dingoes take your baby. Remember that? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Right. There's a couple things visually that we need to be very aware of when working with on-screen text. Okay, we've talked about some of the, the, some of the reasons why we want to work with on-screen text, but there's some design considerations that we have to focus on. Okay? Color. Color. Talk to me about the color of the text that you see on the screen here. It's what? It's green? Blue. It's bluish green. Yeah, it's a bluish green. Depending on how your eyes interpret color, I can, I can see that. Uh, there may be a gradient in there, okay? Very possible. I think you're right. Absolutely. Talk, let's, let's get a little bit more uh, directed and focused on the color of the text. Yeah, it's calming for sure, right? I love it. I love it. Clean, calming, right? If this was bright red, uh, what? Colors. Also, company branding colors. But however, the company branding colors are also incorporate red, right? So why did the designer go with blue? I, I think, think it's kind of like it's connecting because they're talking about the world and like. What's the one? What's the one thing on our world that connects everything? The water. The water. Ocean. Yeah. Good. I love that. I love that. And Absolutely. Right, yeah, I love it. If you look at the psychology of color, blue is also a color used for things that are uh, like trustworthy. Yes, right, absolutely. Go ahead. So it makes whenever, this, whenever they use red, it makes it stand out. Like yeah, how does red make you feel? On alert. On alert, kind of makes Awesome. Yeah, awesome, okay. Uh, but red makes me feel kind of aggressive, 
Kind of makes me feel jittery, like I want to move. You know, it excites me, right? Blues and greens make me go, okay, it's all right. I'm just going to sit down and relax about this for a second, right? The color of our text is going to have a subconscious effect on how our audience interprets that text, right? If we want our audience to read the text, be consumed in the text, and focus their energy on the text, we've got to present it in a color that's going to attract them, not repel them. Blues and greens and the cooler colors often do that, which is kind of nice. It also plays into the effect of the letters, how they're morphing into each other. It's like the water. Kind of ripples. I love that. We're getting deep. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Let's talk about the color of the text in relationship to the background. How would you describe that relationship? Take it one step further, and you're right. It's, I don't know if it's white or maybe a very, very, very pale blue, very, very light blue. Okay. The sides are bluer, and the center is white. Yep. Let's focus just on the center, and because you're, you're absolutely right. That little that little effect that you see where the the outside colors are different is called a vignette. Okay. Go back to the idea that it's blue and white. Bingo. There it is. Contrasting colors, right? Contrasting colors. If we had white text on top of a light blue background, would we be able to read that text easily? No, absolutely not. It's, it's even more so important in the animation world that our text pop off the screen. Because they, our audience is only going to have a couple seconds to read this bad boy, so we've got to ensure that we grab their attention with it, right? We, get, we have to make it so legible that they can see it from the other side of the room, right? If you think about reading a poster, we have, we've been starting to put up some posters around campus about events that are going to happen you know, over the next couple months. If you think about your time with a poster, you get to stand at what distance from that poster? Existentially, it's as close as you want, right? You can stand inches or feet away, and the experience of reading that text is going to be different based on how far, you, how far the audience is from that from that poster, right? We don't have that luxury in the television world, right? Because how close is our audience to our television? Ten feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people a little too close, right? Some people need to step back from the television and let their eyes relax a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone? The average viewing distance in the television world is about ten feet. It's about ten feet. So we had the design for that distance, okay? If the contrast ratio between the background and the foreground is really, really, really tight, we're not going to get the separation that we need to ensure our audience can read it in the time that they have in front of us. Okay? Contrast ratio is, is, is an important one. We have to strategically pick the colors both on an emotional level, which we were talking about before, but just on a pure legibility level as well. Okay? That's an important one. Let's take a look at, at another example that uh, continues this idea. Now this next example actually has three different animations all in one. So we're going to we're going to take a look at uh, we're going to take a look at each one of them individually, okay? This is pretty cool. So hopefully I'll be Johnny on the spot and pause it when I need to. Here we go. All right, pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. I love this. I love this. So we're, let's talk about some new things with text. Okay, The movement of text, in addition to the design of the text, invokes an emotional reaction, right? Let's watch that commercial again. And I want you to focus specifically on the movement of the text. Because this is an animation class, so it's important to actually talk about movement on top of the design skills. Okay, Well, watch the movement of the text. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. This style of animation is called kinetic type. What would you imagine kinetic means? Yes. Moving. So it's moving text, right? Moving text. Now, what did you guys, how did you guys feel at the conclusion of this commercial? Yeah. <laughs> A little nervous, right? Yeah. Exciting. Exciting. You're ready to go. Okay. Uh, if you looked at, let's, let's break down some of the movements. It's pretty cool. The designer of, these, of, these, of this commercial, I think, just did it absolutely magnificently because they were able to tap into a whole series of visuals that we're already familiar and comfortable with as an audience, right? At the beginning, it's a radio call. We have a possible 1022 in progress. So if that's the radio call from the 911's dispatcher, 
it makes sense even just for a couple frames that we see the audio waveform in the background. It happens really quickly, but we understand the context of the audio in relationship to the text, right? Now in this moment, let's talk a moment, uh, or in this, in this frame, let's talk a moment about some of the things that we were just mentioning. Colors. Reds, right? Right, what about the red? It gets you going. It gets you energizing. If this is all like greens and kind of pastel yellows, would we be as excited about going and arresting someone? Probably not, right? This is, a, this is court TV, right? We want people to be all like, yay, law enforcement, justice, you know? We want people to be excited and energized by the images that we're showing them. That's a good feeling that there's like a murder going on because like the color red is just good blood. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it also works on another subconscious level by uh, kind of tapping into what we see all the time with law enforcement, you know, cop cars. What color are their lights? Red and blue, right? Red, blue, and white. We see red, white, and blue on our screen here. So again, we're kind of stimulating our audiences by what they're used to already seeing. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's keep going. I always love this one. This is one of my favorite ones because it's so subtle that a lot of people miss it. How, what is the perspective of our, of our scene here? Is it a Petri dish? It kind of looks like a Petri dish. Does anyone, does anyone pick up on it? This is, not, this is not what I was trying to go for here, but it's, uh, I just love it. I just got to take a step back and talk about it for a second. Yeah, it's wet pavement, right? It's as if the camera has looked down at the concrete and we're getting the spotlight from the helicopter, which we are about to see here in about a second. Huh? The city, absolutely, the city concrete. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, it looks like it's raining now. I just absolutely love it. Talk about the contrast ratio between the letters in the background here. Is it low or high? Very high contrast ratio, right? Almost a pure black background with slight dark red tones. You got white text on top of it. Very easy to, easy to read. And also the color of the text makes it look more A little bluish. I love it. Love those little details. Success truly resides in the details when it comes to work like this. There's a helicopter. I love it. Oh, this, is, this is one of my favorites. Just animating a light in the background above the text gives you the illusion of what? The helicopter. Isn't that brilliant? Just such a small little detail like that immediately makes an image in your mind. The, the what? <laughs> The flares, yeah, this is, this is like a J.J. Abrams flare thing, okay? They may have been a little heavy-handed with the flares, okay? But that's okay. It's still pretty great work on, on top of that. Okay. Pretty great, huh? Let's watch the next one, and we'll talk about it. All right, a little bit different, a little bit different. Let's watch it again and uh, take a look at it. Okay, let's talk for a second here about the movements. What, what kind of movements did this feel like? Rapid. Rapid movement, driving movements. I'd say it's almost kind of like a first person movement, right? You kind of get the illusion from the animation of, uh, of the scene here that you're in the moment, right? You're in the cop car chasing after the bad dude, and you're jumping out of that cop car to go you know, hunt him down. I mean, you feel like you're there, okay? How is that amplified by the use of on-screen text and the design of that text? Yes, they're visualizing what's happening in the narration, okay? Let's talk about how we visualize certain things. Now, in this particular frame, stay on them, stay on them. Woo, I love it. Here we go, and it smashes, and now we're on foot. Okay, let's look at this one frame, because this is an interesting section inside of this commercial. We have one word that's not white. Why? Suspects on foot, okay. But why not have the you're entire light the in white? You're not in the car anymore. Well, don't take the, you know, we're not 28 foot, yeah, we're not in the car anymore, we're on foot. The actual words, we understand their meaning, but let's talk about the design of those words. Why is the word on in black? Why isn't it white? Yeah. Yeah. 
I love it. So it's a continuation of the theme, absolutely. We have a unified color palette, red, white, and black. So at the very least, we're continuing the theme. I like that. Jess? Also, it's a supposition, so it's like not an important word in the sentence. Like maybe it's got to be fit and then sort of fit in the And then foot, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a throwaway word, right? Yeah. I mentioned earlier that we only have a small duration in time for our audience to read the on-screen text. We need to hedge our bets. We, I need to assure as the designer that they're getting the words, that their subconscious is reading what they absolutely need to read to understand the situation, right? What two words do I need them to read? 28 and foot. I bet you a lot of you guys didn't read on because it happened pretty quickly, right? But you read 28 and foot and your subconscious probably filled in the blanks. It also helps that you got like somebody in the background just like shouting out what the words are. Certainly helps. Certainly helps. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. It, it is it is a nice a, a nice little subtle difference. It keeps it you know. So here's another great example. What words do you see? Down and ground, right? The contrast ratio between the black and the red is not as uh, is not as high as it needs to be. Okay, it's pretty low actually. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, that could be it too. Could be it. By having these, these words in alternating colors, we're drawing focus to the words that we absolutely need our audience to read. We need them to read down and ground. If those are the only two words that they read, they're still going to understand the animation and the movements that are, that are yet to come. Okay? We're drawing focus. I would also say down and ground are on the narration of the two words that the author is emphasizing. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's look at a couple more. I think there's one more in here. So is your really important? No, just watching. That's all you need. Watching court TV. That's all that's really important. Pretty cool, huh? By changing just something as simple as the color of the words, we're able to focus our audience on precisely what they need to read to understand the larger context of the animation. They only have a heartbeat to read these things. So it's important that we hedge our bets and ensure they're reading what we need them to read. Let's look at the last one, which is my favorite of the three. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. A little bit different from the other twos uh, as far as their, their design and their animations, but you definitely get a really extreme feeling. I just love the movement of the text on this one. Pretty cool. Okay, let's break it down and take a look at it. Okay, so the beginning starts quite calmly, as I would imagine most uh, police calls often do, right? <laughs> Officers in need of assistance, and then it gets more and more chaotic, right? I love how it builds in the tension, and then we finally get the release of that tension when we physically are breaking down the door. And where I mean, every one of you guys had in your mind's eye a vision of you storming down a door and after a bad guy, right? Has anyone actually done that? Because I want to talk to you. Because I think that'd be so much fun. That'd be they'd sign me up. I'm ready to go. I always wanted. I've always wanted to be the dude with like the gigantic, like you know, the big battering ram. Have you seen that on my like, cops? There's always like a dude with a big battering ram. I've always wanted to do it. Where you're, like. Thong, knock down the door, and then all your buddies go in at. I think that'd be so much fun. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. Ugh. Yeah, the paperwork is in intense. Yeah. <laughs> Paperwork's intense. Okay. So let's uh let's take a look at, at some of the, the text that they used in this uh in this commercial and break it down, talk about it. Okay. So what are the words that you read? Officer and assistance. Now they're all the same color, but it's a little bit different. They are, say again? They're bold. They're bigger, right? Their on screen size is bigger than everything else. This is another area of contrast, and I say this a lot because contrast in my, in my mind are just areas within the frame that are different from one another, right? We have small words next to big birds. Big birds? <laughs> small words. Hopefully next to Big Birds. Big Bird is my friend. I'd like to hang out with Big Bird. Small words next to big words, okay? You're going to look at the big words. 
or you're going to look over in that area first, and I can almost guarantee that you're going to look at the larger words first. Okay? So the, the scale of these items within the scene is going to help uh, establish the visual hierarchy of the frame. Okay, now this one is kind of fun, right? The movement itself, you're moving back with inside of the three-dimensional world, so it kind of emphasizes the back up. You know, you hear back up and the movement is back up. It's a nice pairing there. Um, but when you start looking at the design, this is where it gets a little bit chaotic, right? This is where it starts, where your energy starts to build. Let's play it in real time so you guys get a sense of what I'm talking about. Because it's all leading up to a very important part of the commercial. So what did you guys feel with that shots fired section? See lots of strobing lights. What's that remind you of subconsciously? Bullets. bullets. Yeah. It reminds you of bullets and explosions by flashing those lights in your faces. It reminds you of bullets. Okay? And again, we have nice differences in size. Okay? So your eye is naturally drawn to one of them. There are lots of, there are lots of different options for your subconscious to land on. But you're going to land on one of them, and you're going to understand that, are, that you know, something shots have been fired. Okay? What you read on the screen is starting to help, help you formulate a picture in your mind, which is, I think, incredibly powerful. Switch. Oh, the search warrant part, right? You're just like busting down the doors as you go through all those different levels with inside of our, our three-dimensional world. Text provides us an excellent opportunity to, um, it almost kind of invites our audience into our world. It encourages them to participate and engage. We're not giving them everything, right? We didn't show one picture of a police officer. We didn't see one bad guy, not one cop car, not one helicopter. There was zero actual video elements. All of that was created through text and sound. And your brain did the rest, which is pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. We only need to take the subconscious and the brain you know, to write about the 75 yard line. Uh, and then it's going to go the rest of the way. Or I guess that would be like, what, the 25 yard line? And then it's going to go into the end zone, which was a place that the Denver Broncos could not find in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Hada! I love it. Bring it all full circle. Did anyone watch that game? No, I heard that it. Was, that was a horrible game. Yeah, I heard that rumor going around that they were trying to fix it. Training, you know, to ensure that it was Seattle and Denver in the Super Bowl and not the 49ers in Denver in the no, Super I heard Bowl. That the, one of the teams fixed for the other team to win. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm, interesting. I don't know if it's right or not. Yeah. Conspiracy theorists. I love it. Okay. Um, all right, let me show you one more example. Because in addition to using text, uh, in, uh, like we've seen today, we can also use text a little bit differently, especially when we start to pair it with common, uh, with, with universally understood icons. Okay? The, kinetic, the kinetic text world can extend beyond what we see here. And I've got a really great example that I'd like to share with you. I, I, I love it so excuse me, I love it so much that I actually posted it on our blog. So if you're following along, there we go. If you go to the overview section, there's just I just love this. This is one of my favorite, favorite examples of all time. Let's actually watch it on YouTube so I can make it a little bit better quality. The artist is going to create an entire picture in our mind's eye, just purely based on the movement of our of the text. Okay, uh, let's just watch it, and then we'll take a look, and we'll take a look at it uh, in a little bit more detail as we go through the rest of the day.
Pretty cool, huh? I love it. I love it. It's one of my favorite kinetic type examples on the face of the planet. It's absolutely <laughs> adorable. I love it. Okay. All right. So I wanted to talk a bit about the movement of the text now. We're talking a lot about design and placement and colors and all that jazz. But the movement of the text can evoke an emotional reaction just as easily as how we design it. Okay. Now, you didn't have to see a picture of a swing set, right? Didn't have to, we didn't need to show you a picture of the swing set. What in your mind's eye made that image of a swing set? The word swinging, okay? We're kind of drawn up, I know, it's almost, it's, I hate it when designers do this, because they're manipulating me, right? I hate that, that drives me crazy. I want to think I'm in control. Oh, no, they're not, you know, you're not in control. The designer's in control. He's making you think about what he wants or she wants you to think about, okay? Which is, yeah, it's good design and it's core, but it frustrates me, right? I didn't need to show you a picture of a dog. I just needed to show you a movement that reminded you of a dog, right? On the little serif there on the G, you know? Swagging his little tail. Hello, little dog. That's kind of fun, right? He, he reminds you of a dog. Yeah? Huh? Yeah, I have no idea why that reminds me of a There's a bazillion other examples inside this video. Uh, okay. Bathroom. Let me see if I can do that. All right. Yeah. And here we go. Here's another great example. Unfortunately, this is on YouTube, so I can't frame by frame it. But in this particular one, they're talking about you know sitting around staring at the walls, right? So what is the movement like in this section? You're focusing. You're trying to figure out. You know, it's like when you do when you're focusing. You're trying to figure out which plane inside of the three-dimensional space you're going to focus on. So it's blurring like it's you're trying to focus. The movements. And then I love the, you know, the imageries, there's Macy's, here's Macy's, excuse me. I love it. Okay. And then there's the course. The course isn't as illustrative. Let's keep going. That's sad. You can cry, but I'm not going to hear you. Aw. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so we hung a flag above the door. Okay, so you're starting to see images that remind you of flags. And then we go down and then checked out our gourmet grocery store. Okay, the movement in here is starting to create a sense of excitement. It's almost encouraging and, demand, and demanding that you continue and you follow along. Kinetic type allows us to keep our audience engaged. We're always attracted to movement. Unfortunately, I worked with a producer here locally who will, who will remain nameless since I'm live streaming all of this to YouTube, who had a solid track record of doing very bad design work. And as a motion graphics designer, some days you're really at the mercy of a creative director or a producer. Uh, they usually set the pace. When you're working with a good creative director or a really great director or a producer, they give you a lot of creative control, right? Because you're the professional, you, can, you, know how, you know how to design stuff, right? Oftentimes directors don't. And this one director was insistent upon always uh, attracting or always attracting our audiences away from the problem areas by putting a, sharply, a sparkly shiny thing in there. Oh. And it was just driving me. They go, oh, just put a sparkly thing over there, have like something moving, and then they'll look over there, and then they won't see the glaring mistake that I missed while I was filming this thing. And as a designer, you're like, you should, you, okay, you should have made the mistake, but I get what you're trying to do. That's frustrating, right? And he did it a lot. He had a good track record of doing it. The audience is always going to look where there's movement, okay? We can use that to our advantage to inspire them to continue to watch the show, right? The moment that our stuff turns into a static image, audiences are going to turn off, right? No one wants to watch a picture on a television, a static picture on a television, okay? If it's absolutely still with no movement, they're not going to want to watch it. They'll, they'll tune in for about five frames, they'll look at it, they'll consume it, and then they're done, okay? If it's moving, even if it's ever so slightly getting bigger or getting smaller, believe it or not, audiences will continue to watch that picture, okay? If you ever want to see the most entertaining, entertaining kind of display of how impatient the human subconscious is, uh, I, used, I, I worked here in town at uh, a staff job where I was a full-time motion graphics designer, 3D guy, and kind of post-production super nerd. So I worked with a lot of clients, and I worked uh, uh, with a lot of directors and producers that came down to, the st uh, down to the studio. And I had an edit room where I would sit with the directors or sit with the producer, 
and we would go through the show, right? Whether it be a commercial, a documentary, a feature film, what have you. If you ever want to see the most entertaining display of how impatient the human subconscious is, make someone sit through five seconds. Five seconds, which is not that long, right? Five seconds of black. It's amazing how quickly people will start to wiggle and squirm if you say, you know, because at the beginning of every commercial, there's almost always two seconds of black. And at times, there's five seconds of black on the, on the tape that we send down to Channel 3, for example. Okay? And uh, you know, I'll put the tape in, hit the play button, there'll be five or so seconds of black. And it's just five or so seconds, but it feels like an eternity, right? When there's nothing on screen, it's impossible to watch. When things are static on screen, it's impossible to watch because our brain wants to be stimulated with something new. So we got to give it something new. Okay? Having things constantly moving as they are here allows us to take our audience on this phenomenal, phenomenal roller coaster ride. So, uh, all right, questions on this so far? One of my favorite parts is at the end. Let's see if I can find it real fast. Do we have any musicians in here? Any musicians? Alex, do you play the guitar? Oops. Okay, so you gotta do me a favor. Whoa! Are those the actual notes of the song? I think it is, right? Isn't that crazy? I think that's awesome, by the way. I love those little details and animations. Actually put the notes in the song during the bridge to take us into the next part. Love that. Great stuff. Huh? I like the guy Yeah. A little stop motion animation. Pretty good. All right. So I encourage you to, to bookmark this video. I put it on our blog because I think it's just a, a, such a great example of the type of energy and excitement and almost a little, uh, to a certain degree, a small amount of storytelling that we can do with text. It's just text. So don't, over, don't overlook text anymore. It's actually a critical component to what we're going to be doing inside of all motion graphics. It's the most important uh, for a lot of people, myself included. I spent a lot of time decoding text and trying to figure out how to use it strategically in my, inside of my work to ensure that my audience is reading what I want them to read. So let's take this over into After Effects and start talking about the application of text inside of our production environment, because it's a little bit different. Based on what we learned last week, what is the working unit, if you will, of After Effects? What do we have to have before we can animate anything? A composition, okay? We're going to be building almost all of our assets right now in After Effects. So we're not going to import anything, but we still have to have a composition. It's the working unit. It's our canvas. Where do I go to make a, uh, a composition? File. File? Composition. composition. At the top of the screen, there's the composition pull-down menu. Let's just do it real fast. Composition, and then new composition. Now you're going to be presented with this really, really intimidating uh, window. Define to me the function of this window, this little pop-up. What does it do? I love it. Set some things. What are those things? Yeah, the size. Now remember, in the video world, we're working with pixels, right? That digital mosaic, if you will, uh, that, that we've been kind of creating for thousands of years. So we're working in a defined grid of pixels. This is not a vector illustration program, so everything is pixel-based. The height and width allow us to figure out and set that height and width. Now, are we allowed to change these numbers to whatever we want? No, why not? Yeah, there are guidelines that we have to follow, right? We're no longer working inside of an individual kind of uh, production environment that Photoshop is. We have to create our imagery and our animation uh, in, a, in alignment with the, uh, with the standards out there, the broadcast television and film standards. Where do, we go, where do we go inside of this window to find all the presets that establish those standards? Yeah, all right, the presets. Right now it's set to custom. However, 
If we click on this little pull down menu, we can see all the different presets that we have access to rock and roll. Okay. Now for us in here, do you remember which preset that we're going to be focusing in almost entirely on? NTSC DV. You got it. It's this one right there, NTSC DV. And that immediately changes a number of things, including the height and width. The third most important, or the second out of the three really important elements for us to consume in this window is the pixel aspect ratio. What does this determine? The pixel aspect ratio. The shape of the pixel, right? We're no longer working in an environment where all the pixels are the exact same size. In the television and film world, all of our pixels, are unfortunately, are different shapes. They're either square or non-square. And then we have variations of that non-square aspect ratio. If you're ever confused as to what the pixel aspect ratio is, just go into the preset. This preset here is automatically going to change the height, the width, and the pixel aspect ratio in accordance to what the, the governing body uh, says that it needs to be. And then if you really wanted to go monkey with it, you can change it to whatever you want over here. Okay. Say again. I'm not going to get into it. There's, there's, a, there's a granularity between anamorphic and widescreen that I'm... It's, it's basically when you shoot something anamorphic, you're shooting it at a really rectangular, or what it will show up in the theaters is rectangular, right? But when you shoot it, it's almost going to be square. So it gets squished, intentionally squished. It's crazy. It's, there, that's, it's a whole other level, a whole other level. So we're not there yet. We're going to focus on square and then DV NTSC, so the 0.91 primarily in this class. Towards the end, when we start talking about HD, we'll start talking about this one down here, but that will come towards the end of this course. Okay, um, frame rate, 2997. You know, for almost everything we're gonna do, we're gonna do it at broadcast, uh, so 29.97. And, uh, and then, of course, we also have the duration down here. I want my, I want my composition to be, oh, I don't know, five seconds in length. So what numbers do I need to place in there? Where? Right where the 12 is. Help me decode how to read SEMPTY time code. What's the first set of zeros represent? Hours. What's the second? Minutes. Seconds. And then what's that last one? Frames. Frames of, of, of video. Okay. So if I wanted the total duration of my composition to be five seconds, I need to put 05. Okay. Notice that I have to have two numbers in this section. So it's just not five, it's zero five. Got to have two. Got to have two. And then, of course, I need to put that one down to zero. All right. Background color. What's this going to determine? Color of our background. Okay. So every composition is going to come with a defined background, and we get to determine its color. Yes. <coughs> Some will have the semicolons. Yes, there is a method to the madness. Right now, I'm in drop frame. Okay, my time code is set to drop frame, which is why it's all semicolons. If it's non-drop frames, it's all colons. So if yours is in colons, just change your time code uh, button over there to to drop frame. Okay. All right. So let's just hit okay. And bum, ba, da, there it is. There's my frame. OK. So I want to make some text elements inside of After Effects. It's really easy to create text in After Effects. And luckily for us, we're leveraging almost the exact same text engine that we see in other Adobe products. So if you're used to making text inside of Photoshop or Illustrator, you're at home here as the text tools are practically identical. However, there are some little nuances between the, the applications that we'll, we'll, we'll need to go over, especially since we're going to be animating all of these characters. I'll show you what that means here momentarily. Uh, to find and to create text, it's really easy. At the top of our screen, we have a small little toolbar. Some of these tools we'll talk about frequently. Uh, others we won't. As you can imagine, with that gigantic T in the center of our toolbar, it's going to allow us to create on-screen text. Now, there's two different ways that we can create on-screen text. If you look at all the buttons, there's a common user interface element in the little white triangle in the bottom right-hand corner. What's that represent? 
Yeah, there's more tools nested inside of this button. So if I was to left click and hold on that button, you can see there's actually two different type tools that we have access to uh, here in After Effects, horizontal and then vertical, okay? I've been a professional motion graphics designer for about 13 years. Um, I've never made vertical type in After Effects, but I suppose you could. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and start working with, working with the type tool. As you can see, the moment that you activate the type tool, uh, the cursor changes to the standard Adobe type tool, and we click on it in the OpenGL viewport, and we're going to get a cursor. Now, this works identically uh, to how you would expect it to work. Okay. A little subliminal messaging. Doesn't hurt. Okay. So there it is. I've made my first text. Now, to edit this text, it requires us to open up our character palette. Now, depending on the workspace that you currently have active inside of After Effects and the layout of your interface, the character palette may be hidden. And this is kind of one of those things that people struggle with the first couple times and they get used to working with it. Okay? The character palette right now, currently on my screen, is docked way over here. And because of the size of my screen, it's getting cut off a little bit. However, oops, yeah, just did it. Okay, let's, oh, let's think about something. Oh, no. The stopwatch of doom. FYI, does anyone know what that beach ball means? Yeah, a lot of people think that it's the application has crashed when you get the beach ball, the spinning beach ball. It's actually not what it means. Does anyone know what it means? Nope, not cap locks. It's kind of, it's not necessarily loading, it's processing thing, something. It's thinking about it's like something. It's like the hourglass. So that doesn't mean the application has crashed or that you need to restart. It means stop clicking. <laughs> People do that all the time. They get the beach ball and they're like, click, 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 beach ball. Click, 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 no, stop clicking. That's what it means. Stop click. Let the computer think about what it's processing and then continue on. Um, all right. One thing that uh, people often mix, uh, miss, excuse me, inside of the Adobe interface is this little gray scroller bar. If your cursor, or excuse me, if your interface is being truncated by the size of your screen, this little this little scroller bar will help you navigate all these tabs. Okay. So here's my here's my character palette. If you don't see this on your screen, you can go to the top of the screen where it says window and that long pull down list. There's going to be one option that says character. Okay. So get access to it that way. Well, um, once you jump into your character palette, you're going to find a lot of the same text tools that you're used to seeing in the other Adobe applications. For those of you that are new to this, let me just go over a couple of the basics, some of the all-stars, the highlights from this window. I'm not going to go through everything, but there are some unique differences uh, that make it special. Now, I already have some text created on my, on my scene. You can see that it's right there. If I wanted to change the font, what would I need to do? What's the first thing I should do? Highlight. Highlight it first, okay? It's just like Photoshop. If we want to make a change to something, we have to select it first. Wait, how'd you get to that character? So if you don't see it on your screen. Yeah, then window character. Yeah, okay. So this is this is what's happened on it's Bryce, right? Yeah. This is what happens on Bryce's machine. And it's important to point this out. Someone, probably not Bryce, has changed his workspace. The Adobe guys have a workspace here, a workspace pull-down list, and they have a workspace called All Panels. All Panels is basically going to do something like this, okay, where it brings open every single palette into its own dedicated area down here. And way down here at the bottom, Bryce, I have one that's called Character. If you double-click on it, well, it's not going to be, yeah, that's annoying, so I'm just not going to do that. And I'm certainly, you know, yeah, this is, this is failure. So let me go back to, um, I almost always keep my workspace in standard. Um, yeah, that seems to work the best for me. But use whatever workspace works, works best for your brain. Um, so going back to what I mentioned before, if I wanted to change the font of my text, I have to begin by selecting the text. Now, I'm still in the text tool, okay? So I can select the text, pr text pretty easily. And then I'm free to go over to this first this first pull-down menu, and just go crazy with all the fonts that I have available to me. 
uh, on this machine. Okay. Now, this is just like uh, Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator and InDesign. If you don't have a font installed on your machine, it's not going to show up. Okay. Um, so keep that in mind. It's only going to load the fonts that are currently in your font browser here on the Mac. Uh, in addition to, to choosing the font family, you can also choose the precise font face if it's available. I've gone to the Helvetica New, and you can see in this pull down uh, menu here, I have all the different versions of Hel Helvetica New. And it's going to update as well. Pretty great. So keep that in mind. We get access to all that. This, of course, what is this thing? Color. color you got it. So if I wanted to change the color from purple to, like, let's say, white. I can certainly do that. Let's make this condensed bold. There we go. All right. Now, what about this background one? This is the stroke, the stroke color, which is just a really fancy graphic design term for what? Outline. That's all it is. It's a border color, precisely. It's a border color. Now, the way After Effects works with these strokes color is similar, but Kind of in the application of the, of the workflow, it's a little bit different. So right now, my stroke color is blue, but do I see an outline, a blue outline, around my letters? Do I see a blue outline around my letters? No, not at all. So let's talk about how we can address that. Okay, I want to select all of my text. And if we continue to explore our tools here, this is going to be the stroke color. But this row right here is going to determine the stroke width. By default, it's going to be at zero. So if you want to be a bad designer and put outlines around your letters, you certainly can. I'm joking. That's, that's just an old joke. Some, there's, there seems to be a, a line in the sand. Some designers are like, yeah, outlines are cool. Other designers are like, no. <laughs> so figure out which, which group you want to live in. I'm personally in the no category. I think you should not rely, and this is an animation thing. If I was a traditional graphic designer for the print world, I'm sure my attitude would be a little bit different. But in the animation world, the moment you put an outline on your text, it becomes more difficult to read, especially when that text is moving. Historically, in the design, uh, the motion world, we don't want to have outlines on our text because those little strokes, especially on televisions, are going to flicker. Okay as they travel in between all the fields, uh, all the interlaced fields on your television screen. So I historically don't design with strokes because I, I run the risk of them being interpreted incorrectly on my television set. If you do want to use strokes, go crazy with it, okay? As we mentioned last week, we have a number of values here that all share a common UI theme in that they're yellow with a dotted underline. What's that mean? Yellow with dotted underline. Yeah, we can change it. It says click me, okay? Um, so we can go in and numerically enter in a stroke value. So I can put like six there, and you can see that, boom, I now have a phenomenal blue outline around all my text. One other thing that's kind of neat, these are all sliders. So if you hover your mouse over any one of those input fields, your cursor is going to change that left, right arrow. So you don't necessarily have to do it by hand. You can, use, you can just scrub that value by dragging left or right. There we go. Now I have a thin blue line immediately surrounding my text. Pretty great. Pretty great. Okay. Uh, when you get into more advanced motion graphics and some advanced designs, you can change the order of operations that that stroke or outline is going to be drawn on your, uh, on your text. So you have a couple options here. Okay. So if you don't, you know, some people want to have their strokes behind their text because they're using the infill color of that text element. Okay. The other things inside the character palette, are they're very similar to what we're used to seeing in other Adobe applications. This one right here, what's this guy? Yeah, this is the size. The small t, big t, that's the size. So if we wanted to make our text bigger or smaller, we can select all the words, all the letters, and we can left click and drag and make them smaller. Oops, looks like I put like a tab or something in there. Let me get rid of that. Pat is raft. Raft? That's not going to work. There we go. All right. And notice that we can make these corrections on a per character basis. I accidentally didn't have the D in rad selected when I was applying that stroke, so it didn't get it. Okay. 
which is pretty cool. So we get per character control, as they say right here in After Effects. Now, when I was making, when I was making that uh, um, my text bigger or smaller, I was doing something that's kind of unique. Where is it making the text bigger and smaller from? The corner, the corner right? Now let's talk about why. I have downstairs in my layers palette that text element selected. When it's selected, and we saw this in action a little bit last week with our butterfly open, we get to see a number of on-screen elements, one of which is that little target. You see the little target? It's right next to the bottom left-hand corner of the first character. That guy. Whoops, sorry. That guy, that little target. What is this? The anchor point. What does the anchor point define? If this was Photoshop or even Illustrator, what does that anchor point do for us? You got it. You got it. So if I was to rotate my text element, where is it going to rotate? Boom, right there. If I was to scale it, if I was to make it bigger or smaller, where would it scale to and from? Boom, that point right there. The anchor point is the center of, uh, of our layer. Okay. Let me show you a, a, a little what I'm talking about here. If I was to go down and grab my text layer and expand it to expose my transform section, I can rotate it. And where is it rotating around? That anchor point, okay? If I was to scale it up and down, where is it scaling it? To and from that anchor point, rock and roll. So the anchor point is a really critical element for us inside of After Effects on every layer. When we move our elements around the screen, in my mind, we're not actually moving the text. We're moving the anchor point, and my text just happens to go along for the ride. When we animate something, it's the anchor point's motion path that determines the movement of that character on screen, not the actual image itself. So it's the most important kind of critical element for us to work with. What if I want to change the anchor point? What if I want my, my, uh, uh, my text here to rotate around the, the middle of the letter A in my name? How would we do that? We've got to change the anchor point coordinates. Now, I like what you're, you're going here, uh, Tabari. We can go in and numerically do it, right? Okay, so if you look, one of the five common channels on every layer is a, the anchor point channel, which defines the center, the home, if you will, of this element on screen. So we certainly could numerically do it, but watch what happens when we start to do it numerically. You're not going to get the result that you think you're going to get. If I left click and drag on these values, what's happening? Is the anchor point moving? No. It didn't change its apparent on-screen location. What, what moved? The text behind it. The anchor point stayed in its current location. The text moved behind it. That at times can be rather frustrating. If you were in Photoshop, how would you change the location of your anchor point? Yeah. You click on it, right? Yeah. In Photoshop, you just click on it and just and do what? You just move it to where you want to go. Let's see if we can do that here in After Effects. Let me zoom in so you guys can. Whoops. Yeah, so I'm going to grab the direct selection tool and I'm going to click on my anchor. Whoa. Okay, I'm going to click on my anchor point. I didn't move. It's not moving. When I click and drag on the anchor point, the entire layer is moving. That's not what I want. There is a tool, absolutely. This is one of the big, big differences between the other image editing applications like Illustrator and Photoshop and After Effects. We can't just simply left click and drag on our anchor point, right? However, there is a tool that allows us to interactively change the location of the anchor point. Now, for whatever reason, and I really do mean for whatever reason, the name of this tool, it's right here. It's the one next to the camera, this guy is the pan behind tool. What? <laughs> I don't understand why it's called the pan. I've been doing this for a long, long time. It's always been called the pan behind tool. And I'm actually really happy to see in the most recent version of After Effects, the tool tip that pops over says in parentheses anchor point. It didn't used to say that. It didn't. It used to, it used to, it just used to say pan behind. And first time users would just go crazy with trying to figure out how to change the location of their anchor point. And I tell them, use the pan behind tool. And they go, what? Yeah, what? 
They should just call it like the anchor point tool or something. I have never, and I mean never, used this tool for anything other than changing the location of the anchor point. That's it. So, in behind tool. Once we activate and enable this tool, check it out, we can go grab it. We can go grab our anchor point, move it around the screen wherever we want, and the characters of our, of our little guy is going to stay right where it is. So now, with the anchor point over there, I'm going to rotate my, my text around that corner. Or I could scale it from that location, which is pretty cool too. One other thing, I'm going to go back in time here by hitting undo. Because with text, we have something that's slightly, slightly different. Now right now, at its default, the anchor point for this text element is docked in the lower left hand corner of my text line. What if I wanted it dead center? And I mean like, bam, dead center. How would we change that? Has anyone stumbled upon this yet? Draws focus to the relationship between the character palette and the paragraph palette, which is down here at the bottom, the paragraph palette. The paragraph palette has a number of uh, really important applications, but on the surface, let's just do it real fast. On the surface, it also allows us to align the center point of our text element to the left, center, or right. Okay? A lot of folks think that this is just for paragraphs of text, but it works on all text elements inside of After Effects. So right now, you can see that the, the, uh, the, uh, the text alignment is to the left, if I was to choose the center, watch what happens. The entire text element moves a little bit to the right. But now, my center point is directly in the center of that line of text, which is pretty neat. You can also do the same thing for the aligning it to the right. So you don't always have to change the anchor point by hand if you're just trying to change the anchor point to the left, center, or right. Use the paragraph uh, palette for that. Questions on that? Okay, great. Let me put it back to the left. Boom. And we'll get going. All right. So there's some other cool things in here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll, I'll definitely encourage you to explore how all of these elements work in harmony with each other. So we've got size. This is going to be the spacing between the lines. This is going to be the spacing between the letters. Okay. So if I wanted to do a little bit of tracking, there we go. Pretty great. Pretty great. And also start to warp all of our letters vertically. And also do it horizontally, which is kind of fun. We do some really great effects for all the sub and superscripts down below. So we get a tremendous amount of control as to how our text is going to show up on screen. One other thing to note when working with text inside of After Effects is that it's 100% vector based. Rock and roll. Woo! This is good news for us in the text world. This is actually one of the reasons to do uh, motion graphics in After Effects. Because believe it or not, other video editing and motion graphics applications <sighs> do not have vector text. Like Premiere? Like Premiere. Not vector text. Like Final Cut Pro. Not vector text. Well, Final Cut 10 may be vector text, but everything before that, it's all rasterized pixel based text. So if you want to do video editing, you would use this over Premiere? Uh, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if I was to do text, I'd do it here. If I needed to overlay a motion graphic, like a lower third or on-screen titles, I'd make them here and then bring those and overlay those text elements on top of my video elements in Premiere. Okay. Yeah. All vector text. It's been vector for a number of years. Yeah, a number of years. It's great. Now, for those of you that are a little uh, confused as to what in the world we're talking about. What, what are vector elements? What are vector graphics? There's two different types of graphics, right? There's rasterized bitmap graphics, and then there's vector graphics. What's the difference between them? Not based on pixels. Yeah, so the rasterized bitmap images are pixel based, right? Give me an example of a rasterized bitmap image. JPEG. So that would be what, Jess? What's the JPEG? So like a photo. Oh, like, yeah. like a photo. Everything that we take on our, Cameras. any picture in the way, anything that comes off the camera is going to be a JPEG, right? It's a bitmap image. It's a whole series of square pixels, all with different colors glued together into a gigantic grid. It's rasterized bitmap images. 
What's a vector image in comparison? You got it. Yeah, it's a math-driven shape. It's a, it's a path that's driven by a computer algorithm that defines what that thing looks like. What's the benefit of working with vector graphics? Yeah, we can make it as big or as small as we want and never lose quality, right? We don't get that luxury when we're working with rasterized bitmap images. I'm sure you've Photoshop. seen or, yeah, Photoshop is an entire, I mean, it is purpose-built for rasterized bitmap images. You can do vector stuff in there, but it really is at home when it's doing image editing on bitmaps. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen or perhaps unfortunately have done this where you've taken a very small photograph and have scaled it to make it very big and then the resolution, the quality, you know, degrades pretty quickly, right? That's because you're making a very small pixel into a very big pixel and it now looks horrible, okay? You don't get that with vector images, okay? With a vector image, you can just use the exact same image on a business card and on a, on a billboard. It's great. It's great. So all of our text elements inside of After Effects are vector. So we can make them as big or as small as we want, and they're always going to look perfect, perfect, perfect. Pretty great. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. All right. Questions about what we've talked about so far? All right, I'll tell you what. Let's just take a small break, okay? Small break. Is it, is it me or is it getting warm in here? Vince, Vince and, and, or Vlada, when you're going out, would you mind just propping open the door for me? Let's get some, let's get some air going in here. It's, yeah.
Okay. Let's get back to it. All right. Okay, so a couple things. Before we, st uh, we stepped out for our break, we spent a lot of time talking about how to design text and create text inside of After Effects. But this is a movement class. This is an animation class. So we need to spend some time talking about how we can animate text. And there are a number of different ways that we can go through and animate text. Now, text, as you've already experienced, generates a layer, just like any other layer that we're used to working with here in the program. So the exact same keyframing practice and principles that we explored last week are available and encouraged in the text world. Let's go over that again and just uh, review the basic process of animating any layer inside of After Effects. So I'm going to go down into my Transform section, and I'll expand it by clicking on the little light gray arrow. And we have these five channels. These are the five common transform channels that you find on every single layer. If I wanted to animate the location of my, uh, of my text on screen, which of these five should I be aiming to animate? Position. Position is going to determine the location within the screen. We can see it's X and Y coordinate right here. So let's zoom out for a second. And I'm just going to put this. Uh, yeah, it's based on the position of the anchor point within the frame itself. You got it. You got it. Um, OK, so I want my text to move from the top to the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen. Walk me through the process of animating it. What's the first thing that we should do? Before we even do that, what's the first thing that we got to do? Bingo, the playhead, the playhead, the playhead. OK, now it doesn't necessarily need to be placed at 0. It needs to be placed at where we want this animation, or excuse me, it needs to be placed as to when we want this animation to begin, okay? When, when first, okay? So here's the playhead. It's the red line with a, with a little yellow guitar pick looking thing on the top. So maybe I want my animation to begin its movement on frame 10, boom. So I'm just gonna move my playhead right there inside the interface doesn't always have to start on frame zero. Actually, often it doesn't start on frame zero. So we place our playhead when we want this movement to begin. Then what do we do? You guys had it right. We have to arm the position channel for animation by doing what? Stopwatch, OK? After Effects is not automatically going to animate this stuff for us, right? We have to remind it. We're almost kind of uh, focusing the animation engine on the channel that we want it to animate. And that, therein lies the power of the After Effects animation engine. This is a per channel animation engine. Other animation packages do the entire layer. We're animating everything on the layer. I just want to animate the position. So I'm going to click on the little stopwatch next to the word position. That guy right there. Boom. The moment I click on the stopwatch, a couple new things pop up. You can see that the background color of our stopwatch has gone to a dark gray. And at the location of our playhead, we have generated our first keyframe, that little diamond. Per our conversation last week, what is a keyframe? OK, it defines a major point in our animation. I love it. It's a pose. It's an extremity of our movement. On a technical level, what is it? It's marker. It's, it's, it's a data. It's, it's, it's all it is. Specifically, on the position channel, what little chunk of information have we put inside of that diamond? Where it, is, where, it is. where it is at that time, right? And specifically, if we were to navigate back over to the position channel, in that little diamond, fortunately, my screen isn't. There we go. Let's see if I can do it. Yeah, you can just barely see the diamond. We have saved those two numbers inside the diamond. Keyframes are just chunks of data. Those two numbers, 118.4 and then 127.4, are now saved on the interior of that diamond. Okay. So step one was to place the playhead when you want your animation to begin. Step two is to arm that channel for animation by clicking on the stopwatch and thus creating our first keyframe. What's the third step of animating anything inside of After Effects? You got it. We've got to move the playhead to when we want it to end. Okay. 
So we're going to move the playhead forward in time. So let's just do that. How do we move the playhead? Yeah, we can left click and drag on the guitar pick looking thing. I'm just going to take mine to right about two seconds. All right, so that's step three. Moving the playhead is step three. What's step four? How do we do that? So you can set a new keyframe button. And the easiest way to do it is just to physically move the text element on the screen, right? You can do it numerically if you'd like. But the After Effects Auto Key Engine will make the key for us, OK? So I'm going to go up to my, uh, my text layer in the Composition Viewer and then just drag down to define its new location inside of my movement, OK? As soon as you click that stopwatch, it's always on. It's always on. Yep. Now, you can turn off animation on that channel by clicking on that stopwatch again. But what's going to happen to all your keyframes? They're going to disappear. They're gone. And they're like gone, gone, gone. You can't get them back. The only way to get them back is to hit undo. OK? A lot of folks, they do this. And this is, this is a, a landmine that will unfortunately cause some damage to your production. OK? They'll, uh, they'll click on the stopwatch, they'll follow the four steps that we just outlined, and then they'll say, oh, I've got to turn it off because I don't want animation anymore, and they'll click on it, okay? We've just deactivated animation on that channel. All of that information that we saved in those keyframes have been just, phew, it's gone, right? So if I was to click on that position channel again, what would happen? Be They'd be gone. We'd be starting all over again. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If I reactivate the, that animation channel, all my keyframes are gone. It added a new one, but the one that was on frame 10 is gone. Okay, So clicking, you, you only want to click on that stopwatch once. All right. I'm just going to rebuild my animation here real quick. Something very similar to that. OK. So I got my animation. Let's test it. I want to tap the space bar to give me a little RAM preview. Whee! Is this ever going to be a real-time playback? No. no, very rarely is it going to be a real-time playback. You have a really beefy, high-end production machine if you hit the space bar and you get real-time playback of your animation. After Effects, as a reminder, is a hardware-based rendering engine. So if you're working off of a laptop who is also live streaming this to YouTube, you're only going to get uh, not you know 24.442 frames per second. I'm not going to get the full 29.97. Okay, uh, if I wasn't live streaming to this, I may have gotten real time, but uh, keep that in mind. Okay, it's a RAM preview system only. After Effects wants as much hardware, as much memory as you possibly can throw at it. Okay, uh, in addition, I think I mentioned this last week, but it's also important to point out if you have like two lines of animation, maybe you have like two text elements, you might get real-time playback. If you have two 4K digital cinema uh, video files in After Effects, are you going to get real-time playback? Why not? Probably not, OK? Because the amount of memory that those two files are going to require in your RAM is going to be so much more than just the vector text elements. Can you okay? export to a video just to check if everything works? And then... Absolutely. There's ways to render this. You know, at, well, of course, we want to render this to see, see it in real time. Um, one other thing, and this is something that's kind of dangerous, and I almost even hesitate to show you, but you can lower the quality of your, of your preview window right here, where it says full. Actually, mine's on auto, but you can do full, half, third, and quarter. Um, I like, say again? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just quarter quality, but you're probably going to get faster playback. Mm, not so much. It's actually slower in this particular situation. And that's almost entirely because of the fact I'm live streaming this. That's, that's it. Okay, I like auto. I almost keep mine on auto all the time. That way, it will automatically determine the quality of, of all of my video layers based on the performance of my machine, in, of, of my machine at that moment. It's going to kind of optimize on the fly to try to give me the best possible performance. Um, so that's kind of nice. That's kind of nice. All right. So, woo, we're animating text. This is a whole lot of fun. However, these, this is kind of lame. This is kind of boring. 
I don't like this at all. It's actually kind of stupid. I would like it to give it a little bit more pizzazz. I would love if, to, if I could to give it a little bit more flair, to, to give it a little bit more interest. Now there are a number of ways that we can go in and continue to refine the text animation. If you look at our text layer, there's another channel here that's important. Of course we have all of our transform stuff. But we also have this text layer. And there's a lot of different animation stuff that we can do in here for text. Okay? For example, one of the things that we can do is start to mess around with the path. Now, right now we don't have a path for our text. Let's see here. I gotta, I'm going to go in and get rid of all of the animation that's currently applied to my, to my guy. And on this layer, I'm going to just add a path. You'll see this in your homework. Let's do something like that with the Bezier pen tool. Yeah. Pretty cool. Let's, let me, uh, I did some stuff really quick there. Let me just go back in time here and do it again. Um, you know, much like other applications that we have access to, we can design our text on a path. It doesn't necessarily have to be straight. Okay? So we can use our Bezier masking, our pen tool, excuse me, to create a Bezier curve and, and constrain our text element to that curve, which is, which is kind of nice. Now, one of the things that you have to be very, very aware of inside of After Effects is that whatever is selected with inside of, the, uh, of your layers palette is going to determine the function of the pen tool. I have my text layer selected right now. Visually, how do you know that that text layer is selected? Yeah, yeah, the background color of that text layer is this pad is rad is that light gray color. That's the visual indicator that this is selected, okay? If I have a text layer, or any layer for that matter, selected, the pen tool, which is this guy, it's right next to your text tool, the pen tool is going to allow you to generate what's called a mask. And if we have our mask be an open mask, it's just going to be a line. If we close it, it's now going to remove content from this layer. More on that later. So don't close your paths. So there's my little line. And now when I go back to my direct selection tool, I can go into my text options under path. And where it says path, I can choose mask one. And you saw this. This is what I got before. Now it's following that path precisely, which is pretty neat. Once we enable that feature, Check it out. We can also, we also have some really great options, including perpendicular to path. So maybe we want to put that back to off. That's kind of neat. Can, and, and, uh, excuse me. Can make it move by animating the margins. Whee! That's kind of fun. It's like a roller coaster. You got to have sound effects in life. Life is so much better with sound effects. Yeah, I mean, woo! I can do that. I can do that all day. And then if you had the uh, perpendicular to path on, then it takes a whole new kind of. That's kind of neat. It's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. So it's a great way of animating these elements to give it a little bit more dynamicism. I think I had, I think I saw a question. Okay. Um, now a lot of these channels down here. Hello, After Effects, wake up, please. A lot of these channels down here at the bottom have stopwatches next to them. There we go. What does that mean? Yeah, that means we can set keyframes for them. So these can be animated. So if I really did want to have Coaster Hill that I created, animating this channel here will allow me to generate that illusion. It's even more options. What are, uh, okay, this is, this is the, the more options gets into something that's kind of kind of complex. We can do things on a per character level or we can do them on a per word level. Okay? Now notice how pat is and rad, since they're all words, they're animating differently now. They're rotating as a group instead of each individual character, which is kind of cool. So we can do per character animation. That's kind of neat. Yeah, that this is I think better, probably a better example. Now each word is kind of cruising in instead of each letter. You can also, let's see, that's uh, it's word. You can also do line, so this is kind of fun. So each line of text is going to act as its own 
his own entity. So definitely very cool. Say again? Now it's more of a log ride. So a lot of options on how we can make our text animate onto the screen. Whee! Okay. Ah, this is kind of fun. Source text. This is kind of a neat one. We can animate actually what the text says, which is kind of neat. It doesn't always have to say the exact same thing. This is kind of really kind of groovy, actually. Let's keyframe that. And I'm going to go forward in time and grab the text tool. And I want to, I want to physically change what my guy says. Whoops. I'm going to go. My computer is acting oddly here. There we go. And no, he is not. All right. Now that keyframe it in. Yep. Now, if you notice, the moment that we hit that second keyframe, it changes to a new line. So it's not going to interpolate between them. It's going to click in a new line of text. So for the first uh, 120, or excuse me, for the first 80 frames or so, it's going to be this line of text. And then once we hit that square keyframe, boom, it clicks into another one. So lots of options here with the text tools. It doesn't, one line of text does not always necessarily uh, have to stay the same. You can change the words by animating them on the screen. OK. Now, I want to show you the most intimidating part about working with text tool or text layers inside of After Effects. Notice that when we have the layer, it says text, little T, cool little icon, pad is rad. We expand it, we have this text section, and then cruising out over here, we have this interesting, ominous little button that says animate with a little circle uh, button next to it. Well, if we click on that button, check it out. A whole series of new animation uh, channels are exposed to us. We can actually animate more than meets the eye inside of After Effects, or like Transformers. Okay. And you can see these are all the different things that we can animate over time in After Effects. And there are a bunch of them. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll, I'll let you continue to explore these on your own. Um, however, like fill color, for example, maybe we want to change the color of our text. We can do so. And now we have, under this animator one, a fill color option here. My text is red. So if I went back to, to frame one, can set a keyframe for fill color to be red. And then I'll just move my playhead forward, choose a different color from the color wheel, like blue. And now it's going to transition between those two colors. OK? Really, really neat. So don't forget about this little animate palette. There's a whole bunch of things in here that will allow you to do some really neat effects. I'm not going to go through all of them because there are quite a bunch of them. However, as you start to explore, you can see that the, the options that we have available to us uh, kind of expand exponentially. It's pretty great. Questions on, on that part? OK, let me show you one final thing, and then we'll jump into our lab work. OK. So here's my line of text. After Effects has a really cool system of preset text animations available to us. Some of these presets are the bomb, and I use them all the time. Others I would never touch with a 10-foot pole because they're stupid. Okay, But knowing where to get access to them is really critically important. There's nothing wrong with using presets. They are, however, at times very difficult to wrangle as we're kind of using someone else's system in our world. And at times, those don't necessarily match up. Let me show you how to navigate to all the animation presets in our system for viewing those presets here, on, here in, the, in the system. I'm going to start off by having my, my text layer selected down here in my timeline. And then at the top of the screen, we have this animation pull down win menu. And one of the things that we have is browse presets. Okay. Now, it's important before you click on this button that the text layer is selected, because that's the magic in here. You can browse the presets at any time, but if the text layer is selected, uh, we'll be able to apply a preset directly to it in Bridge. So it's going to open up Adobe Bridge, and it's going to take forever, because it's a bridge. On my machine, Adobe Bridge just takes forever to load. Is it just me? Okay, now it just takes, it's a slow app. So give it some time. 
Okay. In addition to launching the application, and if you're not familiar with Bridge, you know, go take Photoshop. Okay. They'll get you familiar with Bridge. Okay. Gcom 3.30. For us, it's just a way for us to navigate around all of our preset libraries. Bridge is a neat app, as it allows us to uh, kind of visualize our 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 data and our photographs and our videos in kind of a really neat way. All right. Here we go. And it's taking forever because there's a lot of presets and it's loading them into the RAM. Here we go. Building criteria. That's fun. All right, here we go. So it is now taking me to my preset library. Okay. And as you can see, we have a whole series of folders here. The ones that, you know, explore these on your own. However, the one that I want to draw your attention to is the text folder double click on it and these are all of the text presets that we have available to us in After Effects. And as I mentioned, there are some there are some winners in here and there are some losers in here. So navigate at your own, you know, at your own risk, okay? There are some good presets, but there are also some bad presets. Particularly, I, I like the, the way that the guys down of Adobe have organized all these folders. If you read the if you read the folder names, it kind of give you an idea as to their function. Uh, like animate in. If we were to go in here, it's going to give us a whole series of presets. Check this out. If you click on one, you'll get a little preview right over here. Let's do center spiral. Wait for it. It's going to load. This is a, this, they'll give you a preview. It's just taking its time today. Come on, bridge. So I'm an animate in. And I don't know why. Oh, it's thinking about it. So I went too fast. An error message. What? Error. The operation could not be completed. Fun. On any of them. I wonder if that's just a bridge thing. Try closing bridge and reopening and see if you get a different result. Is anyone else having the same problem? Yours doesn't open at all. Yeah, like mine. It was not showing the, I'm getting a beach ball of death here. So it's thinking about something. It's actually trying to load a preview of all, there it is. Now mine worked. Fade up and flip. Okay. So just give it a moment. Give it a moment. I had to give mine a good couple minutes for it to think about it. Um, and that's probably because I'm doing eight things at once on my laptop. And now I should be able to, like if I do espresso eye chart, it really did load all of the presets into the memory right now, which is why it was taking forever. So now we can just go through and kind of audition all of these little presets. And some of them are pretty neat. Some of them are kind of lame. I'm not saying that one's lame. It's just, uh, you know, just be, be careful. Here's my, here's my method of evaluating which ones are winners and which ones are not winners. If you see it on television, winner. If you never see it on television, Loser. <laughs> okay. There's a reason for you. The reason why you don't see those things on television because they're stupid. All right. Like the 3D cube flip. Have you guys seen that? That's a, no, you just don't see 3D cube, cube flips on television, right? It's like when it, it, it's like a transition between video elements that makes it look like each, each side of the cube is rotating and it's just really stupid and you never see it on television because it's lame. Okay. So just be careful with these. There are some good ones in here and some lame ones in here. Please be careful. Okay, you are responsible for your own taste. Spit, you know, some of these are really good, so check it out. All right, so let's do not that one. Character shuffle in. Okay, let's pick one that I was just on. Let's do not that one. I don't like that one. I don't know why I'm being so picky. Slow fade on. That that one will work. So once you find an animation preset that you like. Double click on it. It should take you either take you back to After Effects or load the preset on the selected text layer in After Effects. Let's go back. Yep, and mine just updated. And so now when I scrub through, you can see that text yay is slowly fading in. That animation preset was automatically applied to the selected text layer in After Effects. Now this is where working with presets can turn into a little bit of a nightmare because you are using someone else, someone else's design, someone else's machinery inside the context of your animation. 
editing these presets, it's not impossible, certainly not impossible, but it is at times challenging depending on the preset that you've selected. So where should I go? Maybe I, maybe I want to change the speed in which all of my characters fade on. Where should I look to go to do this? Where do we find all the other text information? All the other text specific channels for that layer? Yeah, under that drop down arrow. If I want to find specific information about a specific layer, I'm going right down over here. Click on the gray arrow. Here's the text layer. I, don't, I know it's not in the transform section. It'll be in the text layer. Before I expand this, check it out. If I cruise over here to my timeline, see the little dark gray dot? Not a diamond, right? The only thing that we're used to seeing in our timeline is a diamond. Now After Effects is telling us that there is, oh, now After Effects is giving us this dark gray dot. Does anyone have an idea as to what this is? Keyframe. Yeah, it represents a keyframe but on a level that's buried inside this, uh, uh, our hierarchy. So it's kind of like a shadow. It's After Effects telling us, hey, there's a keyframe somewhere inside of the text area. So if I expand it, now I have three more or four more channels here. Oh, there's a keyframe or a dark circle on this row. What is it? That's animator one. So if I go in there, oh, now we're getting a little bit more specific. How about, okay, so it's on this line which is range selector one. Oh, there's the stopwatch. There's the keyframe. So you're going to have to go hunt for these keyframes if you want to change the timing of whatever it is that you've applied to your text layer. Okay? Question? Nope. Questions on this? Presets are fun. Please use the presets. Okay? I'm not one of those instructors who are like, don't use the presets and ignore that don't even that they ignore that they exist. No, use the presets. I use the presets all the time. Okay, I'm all about not reinventing the wheel, but it's important that you know how the wheel works too. Okay, and I think we've described that tonight. Okay, any questions on how to work with text? Okay, cool. So to get our hands dirty with working with text, I've devised a really fun lab exercise that will allow you to stretch your wings both on the design side and on the, um, the application of the text tools. So if you go back and revisit renderography.com, the lab section, the lab tab, I'm a poet and I don't even know it, the lab tab, um, is going to introduce a really fun, fun lab assignment. Your job this week in your lab is to animate, design, create, and animate a business card. That's it, just a business card. Now, I would like you to use as much text as you can. Okay. In this business card, you want to use this as an opportunity to start establishing some personal branding. Think of this as an element that you could use in front or at the end of a demo reel, or maybe in a website, or uh, online in some capacity. Okay. It's a really, so make sure when you're designing this, you start to visualize who you are about. You're free to use pictures, but I want you to use a lot of text in there as well. So visualize who you are as an artist, as a person, as a future you know, graphic designer or animator or 3D artist. doesn't matter what your goal is, but make this into a business card. You're, I would encourage you to use uh, specific information about your person. You don't have to though, okay? Uh, you about yourself? Say again? You do it about yourself? That's the idea. Oh. Yeah, for yourself. This is a business card for you. Okay, so not Matt. You're not copying this one. Okay, you're not copying what Matt did. You're making your own business card. So we have 26 you know, people in here. We're going to get 26 different business cards. Okay, 26 different business cards. I would encourage you to take this project seriously as it's something that you can use in the future. However, if you're uncomfortable uh, telling me your phone number and your email address, um, I'm cool with that. You know, I don't want people getting access to my personal information either. So if you don't want to have an actual phone number, make it up. Make it up. Okay. Here's my, I've been, you know, I, I've been making up phone numbers for years. My favorite phone number. I use this, I can't tell you how many times I've used this phone number. 
Eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine, eight, six. It's Jenny. It's Jenny. No one? Okay. It's stupid, but whatever. It's entertaining. Huh? <laughs> I'm older than you think. <laughs> I've been cursed with young looks, or maybe blessed with young looks, depending on if your glass is half empty or half full. Um, so feel free to make up all of your contact information, but use this as an opportunity to make something that you can use in your own professional life. Okay? Give us a little bit of information about who, who you are. It's a relatively short animation. Okay? It's not that long. So put your own, uh, your own thumbprint on it. Okay? It's only 10 seconds. It's really not that long. Okay? So please make sure it's 10 seconds. Also, I would like you to do this at the standard definition broadcast specification. So uh, 720 by 480 with a pixel aspect ratio excuse me, of 0.91. When you're done with this, please make sure you render out the QuickTime movie using the H.264 codec as we talked about last week. Let's just revisit that idea once more so everyone's on the same page. So once we're done animating our text, of course, we have to render it out to get it out of After Effects and into a format that we can put on a DVD or that we can put on a website or up on Facebook. Thinking of Facebook, do you guys see all those little Facebook anniversary yeah. videos yesterday? Yeah, those were cool yesterday. Now I'm like, okay, I don't need to see a thousand of these on my Facebook wall. Uh, they were fun, but they were kind of corny at times. So we need to get this out of After Effects and into an industry standard cross-platform format that we can post everywhere. For us, that format is the QuickTime format. So walk me through the process of, of rendering my little animation here. How do I get it out? What's the first thing that I should do? Save. Save. Save your project file first. So I'm assuming that you've saved everything. Okay. So file save, that's going to that's gonna generate your, your dot. AEP, your After Effects project file, so file save. So mission accomplished, I've just saved it. Bam, how do I render it though? Bam, you got it. You got it. So with your composition selected, so I got comp one selected. Composition, add to render queue. And that's gonna bring open the render queue tab down here at the bottom. Now there's two things that we have to change. One inside the output module. We got to click on the lossless button, right? The text, the, the physical text that says lossless. Not the little drop down arrow, the physical text that says lossless, okay? So we'll click on it, this thing right here. We'll click on it, it's going to open up our output module. And there's two things that we need to just double check. Now, if you're on PC, this is something that's really important if you're a PC user. The default format is not going to be QuickTime. What is it? AVI. AVI, okay? AVI is the worst video format on the face of the planet. It's horrendous, okay? Trust me when I say nobody uses the AVI format out there in the real world, okay? It's one of those things where the, the professional support of this format is almost zero, that if you hand me an AVI, the first thing I'm going to think in my brain is, oh, this person doesn't know what they're doing, okay? because it's just you don't use it. And there's a reason why you don't use the AVI. The format is just a container. Think of it like the exterior color, if you will, of a candy wrapper, like a Hershey Kiss. Coming up on Valentine's Day, okay? We're coming up on Valentine's Day, by the way, if you've forgotten, that's next Friday. Have a plan, just don't, don't stumble into <laughs> Valentine's Day. Have a plan, okay? Your significant other will appreciate it if you have a plan. Um, so the format is kind of like the exterior wrapper of your Hershey Kiss, right? I love Hershey Kisses. They're great. Little silver jobbers. They're great. Fantastic, right? What defines the actual flavor of the, the lovely chocolatey, you know, delicious delight on the in inside is the chocolate itself, right? Okay? Not the exterior wrapper. It's the candy on the inside. What, for us in the video world, the codec is like the candy. I want to change the flavor of my candy, okay? The format has to be QuickTime. If I want to change it from dark chocolate to milk chocolate, I got to go right here. The default codec is animation, which is great because it's the, it's, it's the highest quality codec that we possibly can render out of After Effects. But I don't want that. I want, I'm under video codec. I want H.264. Okay? The H.264 video codec is the video codec of choice for the online world. 
everything that you put on YouTube or Facebook automatically gets transcoded into this codec, okay? If you've, if you've ever uploaded a video to Facebook, Vimeo, or YouTube, and it takes forever, it's because they're transcoding it for you automatically in the back end. You don't see the Facebook servers doing it, but it is. Other times, you'll do another video that you shoot on like your phone, it takes like two seconds to upload. That's because it didn't, it was already in the appropriate codec, so it just posted it, okay? We want everything to go into the H.264 codec. It's the most widely supported codec on the market, and most importantly, it also does a really great job of reducing the overall file size of our animation into something that's a couple megabytes, okay? In the process, it preserves the quality too, so it compresses the video, but it still makes sure that the picture looks really, really, really good, okay? It's kind of phenomenal, actually, the level of support that we get in the H.264 codec when it comes to quality. So very small file size, beautiful images, and it's supported across every single platform on the face of the planet. So I'm gonna click on that. So now it says H.264. We'll hit OK, and then we'll hit OK once more. And half of our job is done, because we've determined how the computer is going to draw our image and into the QuickTime format. But we haven't told it where to save all of this stuff, right? Where do I go to determine the file name of my QuickTime movie and the location of it? Output, Output 2. You got it. And once again, we have to click on the yellow text. So I'm just going to left click on the, don't click on this thing. No, 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 no. Click on the yellow text. You'll get the standard OS dialog box. My computer's thinking about it. Bum, ba, dum. Here we go. And mm -hmm. I'm, whoa, whoa. I'm just going to save mine to the desktop. And I'll just call this hats text test. And hit save. There we go. So please make sure you know where you're saving your files. Okay. I'm not going to know where you saved your files. So don't ask me. You got to know. This is something that only you can manage. Okay. As I say more often than I should, only you can prevent forest fires, okay? Let's render it. The render button is kind of hidden over here in the right-hand corner of the, up of the render queue. And then, happy render sound. That means you can wake up and check your file. And there it is. There's my file just chilling on my desktop. Ta-da! And I can play it. I can send this to my friends. I can, submit to, I can submit this animation to the, uh, to the Academy for considerations for an Oscar because it really is that good. Okay. Questions on what we're going to be doing for our lab assignment this week. Does everyone understand it? Understand the project, understand the concept, and the idea. So we've got about, uh, we got about, uh, yeah, about 45 minutes left. That clock is wrong, by the way. Yeah, we've got about an hour. Yeah, about 45 minutes, an hour. So let's go ahead and get started. If, you're, if you work diligently, you may get this done tonight. If you don't get this done in the supplied time that's left in front of you, please make sure you visit the design lab and wrap it up, okay? If we have it on our PC, can we do it at home? Yeah, you can. Yeah. But why? You're going to, you know. Yes, you can. Don't go home, though, because you're already planning on being here. No, I'm not. Oh, I, I, I understand. If you, if you don't finish it tonight. Oh. Yeah, then you can, we can continue working on it at home. Or you can continue working on your laptop here. That's fine. I'm happy with that. Um, one other thing before I let you guys kind of scatter and start working on your lab assignment, um, please make sure you understand and that we also have a homework assignment this week that's also due by the beginning of the next class. It's called Road Trip. It comes directly out of the book. It's a really, really easy, fun assignment that gets our hands dirty, again, working with text and these really cool text animation presets. If you have any questions on the, uh, the technical execution of this homework assignment, please don't hesitate to come find me during my office hours or uh, utilize the services over, over in the design lab. We're here to help. Okay? Both the homework and the lab are due by the beginning of class next Wednesday evening. So at 5.29, this assignment is due because at 5.30, it clicks over to being late. Okay? Any questions? All right, let's get to work. Yeah, I'll go around and answer individual Can I get questions. An extension for the 